Hello. This is just impulsive video I'm making today. Something's on my mind. Um, so in this on the in this historical project of Branch Davidian history, which a lot of it, of course is concerning David Koresh. We're, we're trying to get down to the root of this guy. Like what, what made Davis, David Koresh tick? And one of those um, things is our experiences, right? Our experiences can be very impactful, obviously, to state the obvious, like saying two plus two equals four. Uh, so, but that's, sometimes I state the obvious because it's important when you're studying Koresh to know about his experiences. And in his case, he talked about his important experiences over and over and over again. And one of the, one of the most important experiences in his life was um, when he met his the love of his life, which is in this book here. Um, there's a chapter devoted to her. Okay. So, anyway. Um, now, this person, I... You know, I'm playing games here. The reason why is because I know this person and I and I care about them in as much as I can. I, I've never met them, her. But she's been through a lot. Um, she contributed to this book. And, you know, um, she was not certain about it, but she did it because felt that it that it was time, you know, to, to tell her side of the story. And, you know, she, she's, um, you know, it was, it was very traumatic. I, I suggested to her that she might have post-trauma. I don't know if she does, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, what, what he put her through. And then what's really amazing is um years later like so you know if you know the basic outline he was involved with her then separated for a number of years right during the time when he finds the branch davidians meets um lois roden and then starts his message and then and then in 1987 and i know this because i was there he came back from a trip and he told us the story of how he tracked her down. Okay? Um, well, and then the, and he also actually had tracked down the previous girlfriend too. She's even more not wanting anything to do with any of this. So I won't talk about her too much. I've never spoken to her um, anyway. And I don't want to, you know, I out of respect to people who are alive and their wishes, I'm not going to go talk about things that I, I feel morally obligated to not talk about. But, but since this person has dedicate has contributed to this book and there's a chapter here that i'm i am going to talk about this because anybody can go buy this book and read this and i know things um that i need to talk about because it's part of the story um so i guess the i want to title this video David Koresh or Vernon Howell, really. Vernon Howell's one brief shining 
moment. Okay, now this is my interpretation of his life. So he may not have thought this, but but from what I can tell, I think it's it's certainly in the top five in terms of his major life events. Now, um, okay, so when I had my very first study with David Koresh, and I'll I'll put the chart up in the corner here. He he showed me a a chart. Okay, these charts were drawn by an artist for Victor Howdoff and the Davidians back in the 30s and the 40s. Okay, long before David Koresh was even born. And um and he uh, during the study, he pointed to one of the little faces here. I'll, I'll highlight the one that I think it is. And he said, that is a picture of, of my girlfriend. My, my, well, as far as he was concerned, she was his wife. I don't think she, he called her his wife when we spoke, but, but he believed that that she was his wife. And I, I remember like, I, I didn't really believe it. And I, to this day, I have no idea what he's talking about because like, it's one of those things where he looked at it and you know, it clicked for him. It was his own personal experience. I, I can't take that away from him, but you know, why would you tell me in a way? Like, I don't know. I, she, I didn't know her. I didn't have any experience with her. I'm not going to look at a at a drawing on a beast on a chart and like go, oh yeah, well that looks just like her. I have never seen the resemblance. I do have pictures of her now that she sent me um, from when she was young, but I, I haven't seen the resemblance. But again, it wasn't so, it was an expression, he said, I know that. So it was like some kind of expression that this little, little face has that he, that he recognized. And he link it was part of his experience, right? Like it was some kind of affirming thing. Like obviously he came to the Branch Davidians and he saw this picture and like, oh, see, God is leading me on the right path because you know he had been quite frankly devastated by this experience. Um so anyway, I, I spoke to this person on the phone a while back because, you know, she was cur curious about me. And the reason why is because um, in the process of making this book, uh, the author had told her, uh, I think she wanted to know, how do you know these things? Because I was giving him some information. And so she found out about my existence. And then we, since we have David Koresh in common, we spoke a couple of times and you know, when you have somebody in common like that, you can talk about them. And like, I would say something and she would know exactly what I was, you know, like, like, cause we, we both knew him really well. So we can, we have that in common. You can discuss it intelligently and, you know, and, you know, anyway, anyway, she told me the story of when he proposed to her. And I, I'll tell you, it was very, very moving. I, the way that she described it, again, one brief, shining mo moment of beauty. Have you ever had in your life where you can look back and, and, and it's like something burned in your brain? We all have that. I do. I have a few of those and, and every, most people do like it was, um, it's just perfect. And you look back on that, you like, you could, if you could, if you could get that back, you know, but you can't, I know that like time destroys everything. Ultimately, that's what I think about time. Time is the destroyer of everything. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can, and when she was telling me this story, that's what it felt like. Like in other words, she was able through the, for the skill of narration and her great storyteller, 
she was able to convey to me the beauty of that moment, you know? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many of you know the details of the story. Basically, Koresh is coming off of his previous relationship. Um, he first met her at the Tyler Adventist Church in Thanksgiving of 79. And she, she, she told me this as well. It's in the book. And there's a, a, there's an immediate kind of attraction there. It's a very intelligent woman. Um, she told me about her Adventist upbringing, far superior to mine, like literally Bible studies, you know, all the time. Her, her father was a pastor, um, you know, very traditional Adventist home, keep the Sabbath. I don't think there's TV on, on the Sabbath, if I remember. My father was like the opposite. Uh, my father smoked, he, we ate meat, we watched TV on the Sabbath, or he did anyway. The, the opposite of what a, an Adventist is supposed to be. So when she was describing this to me, I was like, wow. You know, I, you're, you, you're f like, because, well, the reason I bring this up is because theoretically Branch Davidians are supposed to be like, oh, we're the super, we have all the truth. And then the Davidians, they suck because they rejected Bre Benjamin Roden. But then, of course, the Adventists even suck worse because they rejected Howdoff and and Benjamin wrote, and you get an attitude problem. Like, oh, those are just the stinky Adventists who rejected all this truth. And like, of course, it's ridiculous, right? People are different. Like this, this that's one of the problems with this progressive truth thing. It doesn't work. It, it gives you a bad attitude. Um, and so there is a, I'll, I'll play the quote here. Um, let me give some seconds of free time here. I'll be quiet. Well, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are what? Haughty. And walk with stretched forth necks. And want knives. What are want knives, guys? So it's the kind of eyes which we never saw enough of when we was in the world, right? <laughs> this happens in the church, it says here. I got involved with it. Let me let me get something settled because you can hear all kinds of stories about me. Yes, as an Adventist, I did fall. She was the most prettiest girl you ever saw. I was the only kid, and God bear witness in Tyler Seventh Day Church. I was the only kid that didn't go out with other kids Friday night. But when she came to that church and she got there and sang that song, she looked at me right dead at me, and. Uh, And I went to feel those feelings. I didn't know anything about the Word of God yet. But I knew that the way she was wearing that dress, she looked like a banana was fixing to pop out of the skin. And I said, I don't want that, but I got deceived anyway. Because I heard specifically that she wasn't going to be at her father's house, who her father was the minister. Now you know the story, okay? And ever since then, I'm just a devil. Well, okay. I'm a devil that knows a little more about the Bible than anybody else knows. And that's yet to be proven. Okay? May God help us, Samson's of the day, right? So, so you can see that he was very aware that if he spent any significant time around her, he was going to fall. And you can see in this clip I played that there's an awareness of that, right? Right? There's an awareness, um, but, but it happened. It, she was there and he went for counseling and they, and, and, and amazingly, <laughs> the pastor, the father, the father invites him on the family annual vacation, right? That's how focused he was on trying to help. Vernon Howell overcome this previous relationship. And there's a child involved, you know, that he, you know, because as far as I know, both father and previous girlfriend slash partner, whatever, had rejected him. He says, go away. We don't want anything to do with you. And, 
And she was steadfast on that all the way through, even to when he tracked her down in 87, when he was tracking down previous girlfriends. And that's how we found this person in 87 and was actually able to find them. What I was going to say is that he found her again. I lost my train of thought earlier. I'm sorry. Trauma. Despite the trauma, she actually associated with him for the last few years of his life would allow him to come to where she lived and bring Steve Schneider and give studies and talk and say things like, you're still my wife, which is absolutely delusional from my point of view. Creeping out the boyfriend. It's just, it's, it's just crazy. And when I say crazy, I mean that he's acting really I mean, from his point of view, it's, it's destiny and it's God's will and it's, it's, I understand. But from my point of view and from a lot of people's point of view, crazy. Okay. Anyway, it was on this trip, this family trip where the pastor is laser focused on trying to um, save this young man. You know, Vernon was very spiritual. Like he had, you know, just because a lot of you are, are a lot of you are going to have a lot, obviously have a lot. Of, I, I, I do. We have a lot of problems with the things that he did, obviously, and the child of and the, the pedophilia, I understand the pedophilia, but just because he had all of those failings and whatever you want to call them, sins, shortcomings, um, worst, I can think of worse things to call it, right? Just really, in some cases, very disgusting behavior. It doesn't mean that he was wrong about everything because he wasn't. He actually could be rather insightful about certain things. Um, and it also doesn't mean that he, that he couldn't be spiritual, that he couldn't understand certain things about human nature really well. Okay, um, so it was on this family trip, it was 1980, I think around springtime of 1980, that these two people, Vernon and his, the love of his life, fell in love. Um, the book talks about the trip, uh, and she told me as well, they were able to trade Bible verses in the back seat of the car very strategically and creatively in such a way as to communicate. You know, you can go to Song of Solomon, for example, I suppose, if you wanted to. Anyway, interest, you know. Um, and they fell in love. And she was 16 and he was, uh, he was 20. He wasn't 21 yet. Um, And they, uh, she, they went on a walk uh, after they got there and they went on a walk and there was a certain tree and it was a certain time of the day. And it was, like I said, this perfect backdrop, this brief shining moment. Um, and they're in the tree and everything's just right. And I, I think that he, God had, you know, God, right? I've talked about that. Or had already told him, you know, I will give Sandy to you or, you know, whatever. And, um, and he proposes to her. And she, I mean, she's gone. Okay. She's just, you know, she's gone. Like the women out there who've been in love, like you meet a guy that you're just like, it's like, it's, you know, you understand the feeling. It's, she cannot help herself. Okay. And, you know, accepts his proposal, like just lost in the moment, right? This, this beautiful point in time where everything is just perfect. Now, the reason I keep emphasizing that is, of course, because it doesn't stay that way for very long. And the reason why it doesn't is because, again, I must say that in this whole saga, I don't think he ever saw it that way, but, but definitely Vernon was his own worst enemy more than anybody else, more than the FBI, ATF, me, Mark bro, 
whoever. Vernon Howell's worst enemy was David Koresh, I suppose. His alter ego, the, one, the man that he invented. This Messiah, the savior of the world. This, this obsession that he had with this voice in his head that compelled him to do crazy shit like go drive off hundreds of miles because the voice tells you to go to a beach in San Diego and then go stand on the beach. And then after you stand there, the voice says, okay, see, just trust me. See, how, you know, and I'll go home. Like, you know, some of us, if that happened to us, we probably would go look for medical attention, right? Like, hey, there's something wrong with me. I'm hearing voices that are telling me to do the craziest thing. There's voices telling me that I'm going to save the world. Riding on the motorcycle one time, you know, he wrote this down. In fact, my sister was with him. Yeah, on the motorcycle, my sister's in the back. Um, and and yeah, he's having this vision. You're gonna, you're gonna. The voice tells him you're gonna intercede on behalf of the world. Right, like that's crazy, but hey, it made perfect sense, right? And there's this brief shining moment where he's in love and there's the girl and she's beautiful and and will you marry me yes and everything and then he immediately says he has to go he makes a beeline right for the father the pastor because he'll understand he 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 could not and, and he was and i really do believe it's not a matter I mean, everybody in, in my audience, most of you are going to, are going, because she's telling me that, that as soon as he got down out of the tree and starts marching down to go tell her father, you know, hey, we're getting, God told, God told me to marry your daughter. She said she was like a little chipmunk jumping around. Like, imagine the scene. Like, she's, he's walking and she's like hopping around. She was like a little chipmunk. Like, no, wait, stop. No, wait stop stop no and, and she and he's just like well he is like a man on a mission he will not be deterred because she knows that this is going to go badly and it did go badly he paid absolutely no attention to her it's one of those things where it's almost like she's not in some ways it's, it's almost like she's not really a real person to him she's an accessory so he has now achieved this accessory in his life, got that, you know, achieved, cha-ching, you know, and now he's going to go claim his prize because you'd think that if you really were in love with somebody, like if they're a real person to you and they're, and they're desperately trying to get your attention, like you might just stop for just five minutes fucking seconds and listen to them. Hey, you can't tell my dad because it's crazy. And we all know it's crazy. But what I'm trying to tell you is he didn't know that. As far as he was concerned, God had told him, <clears throat> I will give Sandy to you. Like clear as day, just like I'm talking to you now. Just like if you know somebody and you're having a conversation with them and you can hear their voice plain as crystal clear. He heard a voice tell her, him. I think I said her name, didn't I? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to dance around this because I don't want to publicize it too much. But my God, I have to tell this story. If, if you're watching, please forgive me. I have to. I'm sorry. It's in the book. We can't understand Vernon without telling this story. It's, it's, it's core. This is core stuff right here. Okay. Anyway, he makes a beeline all the while. Please stop. Please don't. It's like, um, you know, if anybody's seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, every time one of those kids goes to screw up and do something, he's like, no, stop, don't, you know. Gene Wilder's character, Willy Wonka, it doesn't matter. Everybody just does what they want. Vernon is, he gets to 
um, you know, he, <clears throat> uh, he called out, God has revealed to me that I'm to marry Sandy, your daughter. Your father turned the key in the ignition and the engine went quiet. He got out of the car. Sandy watched as the color in his face deepened second by second. God didn't tell me you're supposed to marry my daughter. And then, you know, all the other things that a father would tell a young man who has been so troubled, so broken, so screwed up. <laughs> He's a mess. He's a complete mess. You know what's really fascinating to me? It's just a few years later, I'm trying to have a relationship with my wife and he's on my ass and on our ass like he has the wisdom of Solomon and he's so experienced and so wise. And I found out all this stuff and it just makes me have so much more contempt. Again, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, I can shift from extreme sympathy to complete utter contempt. I'm really good at that because I can see every single side of it. But anyway, we're not talking about me right now. Back to this is where the crushing moment happens. This is this is the um this is the failure point. Because it's it's all downhill from here in terms of this relationship. It's 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 a it's a disaster. Of course, through shenanigans and deceptions and everything, which is part of the problem. It's, it's fact one of the major problems, which I'm not going to go into that. But they are they are able to see each other. But there's horrible, disastrous miscarriages and and blamings and bitterness and eventually. I, I described the scene to you, like the point where finally, oh, please, I've, I'm working and I've arranged us this beautiful place I have for you and, and, and I'm and, and trying to faux kidnap her. Of course, it's very scary. And finally, through talking him down, I've discussed that, it ends and there's crushing and, and, and it's... So what I'm trying to get at here is the is trauma. Okay, not just for her. Okay, I've spoken to her and, and I, I I do like her very much and, and but she's been through a lot. But um but trauma for, for Vernon. Okay, again I I'm not completely heartless. Okay, I see the tragedy of someone who has this voice that they believe with every fiber of their being that has told them, I, I will give you to her. I will give her to you, right? Just, yes, God. And it's, it's super sincere. You have to understand that. Don't be like the fucking... FBI negotiator idiots, not all of them, but there's at least one guy just clueless thinks that he was a phony. Oh, he's just, he doesn't believe his own coin. I think it's just bullshit. You don't understand this guy. I was there for five years. Okay. Yes. He could lie. Yes. He could Yes, I understand. He was very flawed. Even his own followers would admit that, yes, he was a sinner. He admitted himself. He was a sinner, though um, he'll tell you what his sins are. You couldn't just start running him down that you wouldn't get anywhere with that. But but still, yes, flawed. Right. But then I have a tape where he says, but he's perfect too. perfect because. He's perfectly the way that God made him, right? To be the fulfillment of whatever the hell. Um, 
So this trauma, it, it creates this enormous, enormous cognitive dissonance. Okay? Just like, like, like a disconnect, like a, you know, you can't, we can't, we, we cannot square these two things. The reality, the harsh, cold reality that he does not have her. He never had her again. And yet God had told him, I will give her to you. And he, he never got over that. Not really. And a lot of the things that he did afterwards, and I don't completely understand all the ramifications, but a lot of, the, of his later behavior was connected at least to a certain degree to this massive, this massive loss. Lost love. Because I think more than than any of the other women he ever was involved with, he never could replace her. That's the impression that I'm getting. And she's, um, but see, the thing is that she know she knew that that there was something wrong with him. She did. That's why she she left him. Like he, she, she couldn't go where he was going. She couldn't follow him where he was going. It was not possible. And yeah. And he could never really see that. He had to, he had to, um, in a way he had to protect her, his memory of her. Because one of the things, um, the connection point, I'll close with this because yeah, it's getting long and I just wanted to like, this is like a realization I've had for a while. I'm trying to help people understand this. He found out about the Branch Davidians through Harriet, the family friend, and she was the connecting point, right? He wanted, I, I, you know, I need a prophet. Well, I know a woman who's a prophet, said Harriet. Sandy was there. And the reason why that's so amazing to me is because in all the times he ever told that story, in all the times he talked about her, over the years that I knew him, he never ever mentioned that very important fact. Because when I found out from her, I was like, what? You were there? Like, why wouldn't he ever tell us that? And the reason why he wouldn't is because, see, because she was saying, no, don't, don't have anything to do with, with that. It's, it, there, it's not right. It's wrong. It's because obviously she's a Seventh-day Adventist. She has a Seventh-day Adventist pastor father, they knew about the Branch Davidians and all that, and they knew, and I think there's a very good case to be made, that, that really the Branch Davidians in 1981 are bad news, um, theologically, okay, prophetically. In other words, their track record for making false predictions and all that stuff. It's, it's plainly obvious. Um, now, maybe they would have disagreed with like the Holy Spirit feminine thing, which when it comes to that, I have much more sympathy for Lois Roden's position. But anyway, regardless. But he never told us because I, I swear to God, he probably in his mind just erased her out of his memory from that moment because it's a negative memory. And he only remembered pretty much the good things about her and just never really stopped trying to get her back. So anyway, I hope I've conveyed to you something like this is really important to understand. Till next time.